Perhaps the largest figure in the French Enlightenment is Rousseau. So we'll spend a little more time on Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau was during the 18th century from 1712 to 1778. We say that he was French, but he actually was born in Switzerland. So he was born in Geneva to a watchmaker, which had to have been fascinating since we were referring to God back at that time as a watchmaker. Mm -hmm. He was apprenticed as an engraver for five years, and then he ran away and became Catholic. After serving as the secretary of the French ambassador, he was fired. He met Voltaire, wrote articles on music for the encyclopedia, and was introduced to the atheist de Holbach's philosophical salon. Why he became famous, though, Rousseau, was that he wrote a prize-winning essay. The Academy of Dijon in 1750 had a, an essay contest, and he wrote the winning essay, and it went big. And in it, he suggested that human beings are naturally good. Think of how different this is from the Christian message, right? The Jews and Christians believe that we were created bad, evil, original sin. No, his theory was the opposite. We're created good, but that it's society that makes us evil. We're corrupted by the evils and inequalities of civilization. We're all created good and equal. And then society puts these ideas into our head about other people. Disgusted with Paris, he returned to Geneva. We said that he became Catholic. No, he returned to the Protestant church as well. His most famous works were the social contract, which had to deal with us getting along in society, and Emile, which is a book on pedagogy, on education. The reaction to his works in Geneva was hostile. He ran and took refuge in England with David Hume, whom we studied when we were talking about the empiricists. Interesting, because Hume tried to get a, a royal pension for Rousseau so that he could have a living. But Rousseau, probably today, we would have diagnosed him as a paranoid, at least as paranoid, <laughs> because he believed that Hume was just like all the rest of them out to get him. And uh, there, were some, there were some bitter writings going back and forth between them all. Uh, Rousseau, Rousseau thought that Hume was conspiring with his enemies. Hume and Diderot later vilified Rousseau. But some of Rousseau's ideas, he said, society is constructed on artificial politeness that masks hostilities. Have we heard of passive aggression? That's sort of what he's getting at here. What's passive aggression? We, we pretend to be nice to one another. But in, in subtle ways, we find a way to, to get at one another. We try to be polite. We wear the mask of politeness, but we're really not so polite. He said, political society bind the poor and give, rich, give powers to the rich. So this polite political society, what does it do? It keeps the poor down and it keeps the rich rich. It allows a few ambitious individuals to subject all others to labor, slavery, and wretchedness. A few people are going to be in power, and they're going to keep the rest of us down. As you can see, he's going to be advocating for a turning of this system, politically, and also in terms of the church. He's going to say, our natural goodness and simplicity are thus corrupted by the evils of society. The good people that we were born, no, society quickly corrupts us. It was Rousseau who said there's a difference between the sovereign, that is the power to legislate in any nation, there's a difference between the sovereign and the government. What's the difference? The government executes the laws, the sovereign creates the laws. Sovereign creates the laws, government executes them. He says laws must always be conformable to the general will, which simply means the majority always rules. It's sort of like voting. Whatever we're going to decide, we're always going to decide, and the majority wins. So everything that we do, let's take a vote. What happens every time we take a vote? Suddenly we split ourselves into those who voted one way and those who voted another way. Yikes. That's why as a church, we work so hard to work for, toward consensus so that it's okay, what can we all rally around and come together and agree on? He wasn't that way. He said at the end of the day, we have to make a decision, let's vote. And the majority will always win. And the way that you can tell, the majority then will call the general will, 
And the way that you know whether you're right is whether you are conform to the general will or not. If the majority vote in the same way as you, you know that you're in line with the general will. If the majority vote in a different way, got news for you, you're not in line with the general will. Here in the United States of America today, the general will is that Obama be president. Follow me? The majority voted on it. In 2016, we'll have another chance to see what the general will is in this nation. Well, it could be different. It'll be a chance for you to see whether you're in line with the general will or not of this nation or of this state, right? If you voted for the governor and he's now in office, then you're in line with the general will of the state of Texas. If not, got news for you. You're not in line with the general will. So he said there is a paradox. He said we become free by becoming subject to the law. The law makes us free. How so? He was trying to say, in obeying the law, a person is obeying his or her own reason and judgment and is following his or her real will. By, by following the general will, then that's more reasonable and we're free when we do that. If, I, if I'm just following my own way, then I'm a slave of my own passion, of my own appetites. Is it better for me to be a slave of my own selfishness? Or is it better for me to be free by by aligning myself with the general will. And so he, he argued that the obedient citizen is the one who's truly free. Do you want to be truly free? Then obey the laws. The laws are created by the general will. The general will creates and changes laws. If you want to be really free, then follow those. If we all followed the general will, then we'd all live in peace. How should we be taxed? These were, were early ideas on taxation. He said, we should be taxed on what we possess over and above the necessities of life. Ooh, have you thought about it in the United States? What, what ideas do we follow in terms of taxation? There's a certain amount that you're not taxed on every year. Oh, that goes toward the necessities of life, and then you're taxed on everything over that. Ideas like that are rooted in Rousseau. He said, politics and morals should be studied together. We should study the individual in society and the society in the individual. Politics and morals, ethics, should be studied together. He said, each person is part of the whole and puts his or her power and person under the supreme direction of the general will. So all of us together, all 18 in this room, when we come together, we all put aside our individualness and we subject ourselves to the whole. That's what happens when we live in society. And so we come together and we create this collective. We call it the Republic. He said, we lose our natural liberty and our unlimited right to everything, but we gain our civil liberty and the proprietorship of all we possess. Let's think about that for a moment. I could go off and live by myself in the middle of the woods, but the moment that I come and live with y'all, I give up a few things. Out in the woods, the Lord of the Flies, when we're on the island, we each have the right to do whatever we want, and the strong is going to win. You follow me? And so if I want to kill you because I can't find a deer to eat this evening and I need to eat something, you know, the strong are going to survive. Survival of the fittest. Okay? What he's trying to say then is that I need to give that up. If I'm coming to society, then I have to give up that freedom to do whatever I want. And I have to subject that to the general will. I'll no longer have an unlimited right to everything, right? In the state of war, in the state of nature, then everything is mine. And it belongs to me as long as I can take it and hold on to it. No, when we come to society then, we have to give that up. And in turn, we get our civil liberty and we can own those things that we possess. I don't have to worry about you taking it from me because every person is guaranteed ownership of what he or she has. Natural liberty in a state of nature or state of war is limited only by individual strength. Civil liberty is limited by the general will. When I come and live in society, it's governed by the general will. The majority rule, right? The majority of us make up the laws he says, law is universal, reason prescribes what is right, and everyone ought to do, to do, let's try that again. 
Reason prescribes what is right and what everyone ought to do in the same circumstance. Ooh, interesting. In ethics, we talked about uh, circumstances and how it is that that colors different ethical situations. But not so for a person like Rousseau. It should be that everyone in the same situation would find him or herself doing the same thing. Because reason should dictate what it is that we do. Just think, let's just think about this in terms of reason. If we're, we're all in the same situation, we should all choose to do the same thing out of reason. We should be able to reason through that situation <coughs> what a person should do, what it is that a person should do in that situation. So, wrapping up Rousseau, he said, the true impulse of appetite is slavery. When I'm on my own, just wanting and desiring thing, that's actually slavery. I'm a slave to my appetites and my desires. Obedience to the law is liberty, freedom. How am I free? I'm free by obeying the law. The true sovereign is always the people. Who makes the laws? The people. How? Through the general will. So where do the laws come from? Through the majority vote. Why do we have open carry coming to Texas? Why are people going to be able to carry guns in Texas? Because it's the general will that the majority of people in Texas want us to be able to carry guns. Is that truly the case? Well, it's the, the system that we set up, where we, we elected people to represent us, and the majority of those people decided that that's what we're going to do. And so voting will prove every time whether my will is in line with the majority. The danger of the majority is always that the majority is always half plus one. <coughs> so if you have 100 people, 51 people wins the vote. What does that mean in a situation? If 51 people win the vote, you're going to have 49 unhappy people. Is that a situation to be in? No, not a situation to be in. Better to look for a way. If you have 100 people, how do you find a way that, they, that we can all, as 100 people, come together more or less around us? Otherwise, we're going to do. I think that is our cue to call an end to the French and Latin. <laughs> yes? Rousseau says the general will would be free. Well, is, wasn't that almost the same thing as Jesus' will? Is it if you love one another, we will be free? And if you follow the law, then you're free. How interesting that Jesus is that true? So, 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 that, that's a great analogy. Okay, we have 612 laws. What did Jesus do? He came and freed us from that. With his law of loving God and loving one another. Interesting. Is that how, how it is that he freed us from the law, that by following those laws instead, there's a certain freedom in that. <laughs>